Hello again. Hope you're doing well. I'm Hardleg Joe, if you didn't know. And today, I'd like to talk to you about conspiracy theories. Which may seem like kind of a weird topic for a channel mostly themed around politics, but it's more relevant than you might think. As I've stated before on this channel, I'm a big proponent of democracy. And the whole idea behind democracy is that we arrive at the best decisions when everyone pools their collective knowledge together. This works the best when everyone has accurate knowledge. Being an effective citizen requires that you're able to tell fact from fiction, that you can identify misinformation. And conspiracy theories are a very common type of misinformation. Now to start with, I suppose I should explain exactly what I mean when I say conspiracy theory. Because that term means different things to different people. Wikipedia defines it as an explanation for an event or situation that invokes a conspiracy by sinister and powerful groups when other explanations are more probable. Now this definition is fine and correct, but for the purposes of this video, I'm going to oversimplify things a lot. In this video, when I say something is a conspiracy theory, what I mean is that it's a bad theory. That's a much simpler explanation, just two words. But to be absolutely clear, let's just break down each word real quick. So when I say a theory is bad, I don't mean it's morally bad. It's not an evil theory. It's bad in that it's badly constructed, like a table cobbled together from scrap metal. It's flimsy, it can't hold much weight, and it's probably a danger to the person using it. As for the word theory, I want to clarify that I'm not talking about a scientific theory, like the theory of gravity or the theory of evolution. Those are their own separate things with their own specific rules. What I'm talking about are practical theories. For example, I have a theory that a postal worker delivers mail to my house. I'm not certain of that. I've never actually seen them delivering it. It's possible my mail is delivered by drone or that it somehow teleports into my mailbox. But I assume it's done by a postal worker because there's a lot of evidence that points towards that being true. For instance, my mail has stamps and writing on it that indicates it was handled by the post office. People I know have seen their own mail delivered by postal workers. I've seen similar workers in trucks driving around my neighborhood. And there's nothing special about my house that would exclude it from regular mail delivery. Together, all these facts point towards one conclusion. That my mail is being delivered via a postal worker just like everyone else. To assume anything more complicated would be invoking a conspiracy when other explanations are more probable. Now that's a silly example, of course, but it shows exactly what a practical theory is. It's a logical assumption about the world that is based on facts that you have. It is also falsifiable, which means it's something that you could prove to be true or false, if you had access to all the relevant information. In the case of my mail, getting all the information to prove my theory would not be that hard. I could just wait outside my house until the mail shows up and see for myself how it's done. Case closed. When it comes to more complex events, though, getting all the necessary facts can be significantly more difficult, if not downright impossible. There are times when we'll never know the truth for certain, either because the evidence was destroyed, or the stuff we need to know is like what a specific person was thinking, what their motivations are, which only they know for certain. In those kinds of situations, our only option for making decisions is to build some practical theories. And when that's the case, then it's important to make sure we build our theories correctly. Now, a proper theory has two parts, a conclusion and several supporting facts. It helps to think of a well-constructed theory being like a well-constructed table. 
the conclusion, the assumption you want to make, is like the table's top, which is being held up by several sturdy legs. Those legs are the supporting facts, the things we know for certain that can't really be disputed. If you have strong enough facts, and you keep your facts straight, then not only will they support the weight of your conclusion, but also any other ideas you want to stack on top of it. A well-built theory can serve as a solid foundation, a base upon which you can build your opinions. Now, the best way to show you good theory construction is actually to show you a whole bunch of bad theories. Because good theories are often kind of complicated. Even my goofy example with the mail took way too long to describe. And that's because explaining a good theory involves going over all the facts and showing how each one leads to the same conclusion. Conspiracy theories, by contrast, are often pretty simple. In fact, that's part of why they spread so easily, because people naturally gravitate towards simple explanations. Fortunately, that same simplicity works against them, because once you know what to look for, conspiracy theories are pretty easy to spot. Learn to weed out the bad theories, and everything that remains should have at least some merit to it. All right, so, in my experience, there are four distinct kinds of conspiracy theories, each of which fail in different ways. The first is something I call the one-legged table. You might also think of this as jumping to conclusions. This is where you take one fact and try to balance the whole conclusion on top of it, without taking any other facts into consideration. For example, it is a fact that, in America, black people are far more likely to be arrested than white people. Looking at this fact alone has led some people to theorize that genetics play a big role in criminal behavior. That the same DNA that determines your skin color also determines how likely you are to violate the American legal code. However, if you look at the crime rates for dark-skinned people across the globe, you'll find that the American statistics aren't universal. That the crime rate is only high in America and South Africa, places where dark-skinned people were racially segregated and discriminated against for many generations. This second fact points to there being an environmental cause for the high crime rate, rather than something genetic. And if you gather more facts on the subject, you'll find that that's a continuing trend. That most of the time, where a person grows up is a much better predictor of their future actions than anything biological. That's why a good theory needs to have several different supporting facts. A one-legged table can stand up on its own, it can even support a, a little weight, but it's weak and unstable. It's not sturdy enough to hold more than a couple opinions, and it's very easy to knock over when you start bringing additional facts into the picture. Alright, so the second type of conspiracy theory is something I like to call the wonky table. You could also think of this as reaching. This is where you stretch unrelated or oddly specific facts to try to make them fit an otherwise unstable theory. These are often, but not always, constructed by people who are trying to put more stability onto a one-legged table. Sticking with the example I used before, if someone wanted to try and salvage their genetic criminal theory, they might point out that black people have lower than average SAT scores. Or they might bring up some violent event like a riot and point out that a large number of black people were involved. Now these are facts, but they don't actually support the theory in question. Like, educational tests are irrelevant. The SATs don't measure how likely you are to commit a crime. And you really have to twist the facts if you want to equate bad test-taking skills with criminal behavior. And the riot example is pretty flimsy. People of all skin color riot from time to time. And when they do, it's almost always motivated by some event in the world, not a genetic desire to riot. Metaphorically, these facts are either toothpick-thin or bent all over the place. 
they are barely able to support the conclusion that's been stacked on top of them. And as a result, you have a pretty wonky table that can't hold much weight. It might appear stable if you don't look too closely, because there are a lot of facts there, but because the facts aren't straight, and because the few that are straight aren't very strong, the theory collapses when you try to build anything substantial on top of it. This shows that a good theory not only has multiple supporting facts, but that those facts are directly related to the conclusion. You shouldn't have to twist or bend them to fit the conclusion, that should come as a natural result of the facts. This brings us to the third type of conspiracy theory, and the most deceptive. I refer to them as reverse tables, but it might be more accurate to simply call them propaganda, because these are fabricated theories, purposely created by powerful people to mislead the public. These can be some of the most difficult to identify because they are designed to have the appearance and stability of a good theory. Unlike the previous two examples, which are usually born from laziness or a lack of education, people put a lot of time and effort into making these theories look legitimate. Now occasionally, these will be made by carefully bending unrelated facts to suit their conclusion, kind of like a higher quality version of the wonky table. Usually, though, the creators of propaganda will just lie, because they are powerful enough or influential enough to spread fake facts, manufactured evidence that fits their theories perfectly. Because of this, you can't easily identify a reverse table just by looking at the facts. The key word there being easily. You still can disprove them that way, it just takes a lot more time and effort than the other kinds of theories. Because instead of simply finding more facts or showing how the evidence isn't relevant, you have to debunk the facts themselves. You have to prove that they are lies. And when those lies are carefully planted, or when there are hundreds of them to sort through, this can become a massively time-consuming task. Fortunately, there is a way to debunk these quickly, and that is to look at the origins of the theory. Because only a large wealthy organization or a very influential person can manufacture the kinds of big lies needed to support a reverse table. Which means you can usually pinpoint when exactly the theory started and who started it. You can then look into how they got their supposed facts and see if perhaps they have some ulterior motive for pushing this theory. This is why I call them reverse tables, because their flaw is tied into how they are constructed. A good theory is built from the bottom up. It starts by finding a bunch of facts and then placing a conclusion on top that fits those facts. A bad theory, a conspiracy theory, does the reverse. It starts with the conclusion and then builds legs on top of it, crafting the perfect facts to prove what the creator has already decided will be true. Now the best and most recent example of this is what happened with the 2020 presidential election. There's a conspiracy theory that the Democrats used voter fraud to steal the election for Joe Biden, with proponents claiming that there is a mountain of evidence which supports this theory. Now, it is possible to go through all that evidence and debunk it individually, but as I said earlier, doing that would take a massive amount of time. It's far faster to simply look at the origins of that theory, because it was created by the man who lost the election, former President Trump, who not only has a pretty big motivation to lie, but also the power and influence to push that lie to the public. More important than who spread this theory, though, is when he started spreading it. Because he first began saying that the election was stolen several months before the election happened, long before any evidence of voter fraud could have possibly existed. It is a textbook example of a reverse table. Mr. Trump clearly started with the conclusion that his loss must be the result of voter fraud, 
and then began looking for evidence that might prove his theory later, after he had already lost. And how he got this evidence kind of reflects that. He essentially told the world that fraud definitely happened, and then asked his followers to call in and report anything suspicious. He then treated each report of suspicious activity as factual evidence which proved his theory. Needless to say, while this created a mountain of reports to go through, none of them have held up to scrutiny. Every report is either wild speculation or just outright lies, because it was made by people who were specifically asked to look for evidence where there was none. But I digress. Moving away from somewhat current events, we have the fourth and last kind of conspiracy theory, which is something I call the pile of boards. This is a theory without facts. A conclusion that is supported by other conclusions, just a big old stack of tabletops with not a single leg to stand on. When most people think of the really out there conspiracy theories, this is what they're usually thinking of. For example, believing that the Earth is flat. There's zero evidence that supports that idea. In fact, the mere existence of space travel quite literally flies in the face of that theory. So the only way to support it is with another theory. The theory that all space travel is fake. Of course, if that were true, then the hundreds of companies that claim to have satellites in orbit are all lying, as is every government in the world. Which means creating another theory where all these different organizations are secretly working together to hide the truth, despite actively competing with each other in just about every other way. Hopefully you can see where this is going. Eventually you end up with a stack of theories that encompasses most of reality, just a solid block of conclusions that explains how the world works without needing any facts at all. Now the good thing about these theory piles is that they're really easy for most people to identify. Like, a majority of the population can just inherently tell that these aren't valid theories, in the same way that they can tell the difference between an actual table and a stack of boards. The problem is, more than any other kind of misinformation, the pile of boards can actually be pretty stable. Just like an actual pile of boards, it won't topple over easily, even when a lot of weight is stacked on top. There are people who will base their entire worldview on the idea that facts simply can't be trusted. And when that's the case, it can be extremely hard to break them out of those axioms. Which brings us to the main point of this video. Like, it's all well and good to educate yourself about misinformation. I hope you learned something here. But the primary goal is to help others. To reach our fellow citizens who are stuck believing in conspiracy theories. Obviously, I'm hoping this video will help at least a few people out there. But I have a feeling that the ones who really need to hear this information either won't watch the video or won't accept it if they do. In the end, I think that individual people require individualized solutions. The only way we can hope to change people is by talking to them one-on-one, -on -one, by having conversations. And while I wish I had some really simple advice for reaching someone who's been misled by conspiracy theories, there's not really a simple way to do this. My best advice is the same advice I have for life in general. Be patient and be kind. At least try to be. You won't convince anyone of anything by insulting them or dismissing their views as stupid. And this is especially true of those who believe in conspiracy theories. A lot of them are under the impression that most people are just ignorant sheep who don't listen. And if you simply mock them without acknowledging that you've at least heard what they had to say, you feed into that narrative. So if you know someone who believes in a bunch of conspiracy theories, hear them out. Let them know that you're listening to what they have to say and that you understand their perspective. Just also make it clear that you think they're wrong. And more importantly, 
Make it clear why you think they are wrong. And if you don't have the answers, if you don't know why they're wrong, look it up. Do some research. The information is out there. Or talk to someone else you know. Bring a third voice into this conversation. Any kind of dialogue, any kind of conversation will always be better than two people just ranting at each other. Now keep in mind, you still won't get through to them like 99% of the time. People rarely change their minds over the course of a single conversation. But every time, there's a 1% chance. Every time there's a conversation, it's another opportunity to try to break someone out of that. And so if we can get enough people talking and get them talking enough, then those tiny percentages will begin to add up. And of course, if we can get the media to stop feeding into conspiracy theories too, that would help a lot. But that's a topic for another video. For now, I think I'm going to leave it here. Hopefully, you learned a little something today about how to recognize bad theories and how to build some good ones of your own. You start with the facts. Find multiple facts. Keep your facts straight and then form a conclusion based on those facts, not on other theories. Keep in mind that these rules won't make you immune to misinformation. No one is immune to misinformation but it will certainly help. Hopefully by breaking down exactly what makes a theory work, by giving you these categories and rules for analyzing theories, I've given you the mental tools you need to make better decisions and handle conversations about conspiracy theories when they come up. If I've succeeded, then you will have left this video mentally stronger than you were before. And in a democracy, the stronger each individual is, the stronger we all are. But, yeah. Thanks for watching. I hope to see you again soon. And stay safe out there.